Hey guys, it's Timothy here. I'm actually here for part two of my new segment, which is New Player's Handbook to Magic Rules. Remember that these videos are intended for newer audiences to the game, um, particularly players who may be having trouble with certain um, aspects of the game that come up. Uh, if you watched part one, which a couple people did, then um, this part may intrigue you. I have a bunch of other ideas for this segment, but um, again, this is intended for newer players, intended for players who are looking to uh, refine the fine details of magic rather than just playing casually or anything like that. And it is relevant, especially if you plan on growing as a player and you plan on um, starting to do, you know, F&Ms or tournament play and stuff like that, you really need to know certain distinctions. I talked last time about activated abilities, and this time I'll be talking about triggered abilities, which get a little more complicated. So if you haven't seen the first part, go check that out first, um, and I would love your feedback on that video as well as this one. Please, please, please leave comments. Um, I really appreciate it. If you have any questions or even if I missed something or I said something that was misleading, please let me know so that I can fix that or I know what to do for future videos. So we're going to jump right in. Last time I said that an activated ability is kind of a manual ability. It's something you have to pay a cost for. It's something you have to go out of your way to actually activate. It won't activate without your input. A triggered ability is kind of the opposite. It's an automatic ability. It's going to happen whether you like it or not, and it happens in response to another event or action in the game. Triggered abilities usually use the same kind of language. You'll see sentences that say, when X happens, do this sort of effect, or whenever X happens, do Y. Or another common phrasing is, at the beginning of this phase, do this effect, or at the end of this phase, do this sort of effect. We'll see a bunch of examples here, and it's a little difficult on older, older cards before they really got formatting down, but you'll notice if you look at Oracle text that they've updated most triggered abilities that have this kind of warning. When X happens, do Y. When X happens, uh, Y happens. When, at the beginning of this phase, do this effect. It's very, very specific when it happens, and it tells you exactly what event needs to take place in order for the ability to trigger. So if you look at this common card from Shadows Over Innistrad, Stitched Mangler, it says in the second line of text, when Stitched Mangler enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. The trigger here is Stitch Mangler enter in the battlefield. This is not an activated ability because you're not paying a cost. You do have to pay mana to cast Stitch Mangler, but that doesn't cause the ability to trigger. It's Stitch Mangler actually enter in the battlefield that causes this ability to go off. If Stitch Mangler never makes it onto the battlefield, say it gets countered or something along those lines, then the ability never triggers and you never get to tap a creature. We'll see a bunch of examples very similar to Stitched Mangler throughout this video. ETB triggers are very, very common. That's enter the battlefield triggers, as we'll see here in a second. Um, a stark difference from activated abilities is that triggered abilities do not have a cost associated with them. I just said it, and I'll say it again. There is no cost to activate a triggered ability. An ability triggers from an event, not from you paying a cost. Now, some people will say, but... There are triggered abilities that require me to pay mana, pay life, so on and so forth. Maybe there's a triggered ability that requires you to sacrifice a creature. Yeah, those are costs to some degree, but they're not a cost in the same sense of paying mana to activate um, an activated ability or sacking a creature in order to activate ability or fulfill a cost requirement. So, for example, we have the card Relentless Dead, which actually has two different abilities that trigger when it dies. Just look at the second ability here that says, when Relentless Dead dies, you may pay black mana. If you do, return it to its owner's hand. Now this does kind of seem like a cost. It seems like you have to pay black in order for this ability to happen. But that's not necessarily how it works. It's actually triggered from him dying, and the cost of using the ability is black, but it's not a cost of activating the ability. The ability is going to happen whether you pay the mana or not. The ability is going to use the stack whether you pay the mana or not. Um, it just gives you a choice, whereas an activated ability will never even go on the stack unless you pay the cost. Here, Relentless Dead's abilities will both go on the stack when it dies, and then it'll give you the option to pay the mana. An activated ability's ability will not be on the stack unless you've actually paid the mana up front, so there's a huge difference there. Let's look at a lot of examples of 
triggered abilities, the most common types that I could think of. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, because triggered abilities take a bunch of different forms, as you'll see. But some of the most commons are enter the battlefield or leave the battlefield effects. ETB is something that people say a lot. In fact, I think I said it a couple seconds ago. But ETB just means it's an enter the battlefield trigger. Eyeblight Assassin, for example, says when Eyeblight Assassin enters the battlefield or ETB, target creature an opponent gets or target creature opponent controls gets minus my one minus one until end of turn the trigger is eye blade assassin actually entering the battlefield again if it gets countered there's no trigger because it never enters the battlefield therefore there's no triggered ability this is not an activated ability you didn't have to pay a cost to make it happen all you had to do was have eye blade assassin enter the battlefield same goes for raven rift watcher when it enters the battlefield you gain two life and then when it leaves the battlefield you gain two life i do want to make one caveat here for leave the battlefield triggers that means it doesn't necessarily have to die and go to the graveyard it can be bounced back to your hand it can be shuffled back in the deck anytime you have to physically pick it up off the battlefield and put it somewhere else in some other zone of the game it's a leave in the battlefield, which will cause its ability to trigger. Leave the battlefield triggers are a little less common than enter the battlefield triggers, but they still come up quite a bit. Um, something I like to call phase of the turn triggers. This means the ability will trigger at some point during the turn, a very specific phase of the turn. So, for instance, cards that say at the beginning of your end step, or at the beginning of your opponent's end step, or on each player's end step, that's a triggered ability, and the trigger is going to the end step. The second you decide, and your opponent decides that it is the end step of that turn, that triggered ability will activate and will go on the stack. Same goes for upkeep triggers. At the beginning of your upkeep, blank happens. For instance, Sin Prodder has his ability trigger at the beginning of your upkeep. That means the second you've untapped your lands and you say, okay, it's my upkeep, Sin Prodder's ability will go on the stack. Notice that these abilities are going on the stack. They're not just suddenly happening. So there are chances to interact with them or to get off other effects or instants before that ability resolves. Damage abilities are very, very common. When a creature deals damage to a player, do some sort of effect. For instance, Wind Rider Patrol says, when Wind Rider Patrols deal, Patrol deals combat damage to a player, scry 2. The trigger is that creature dealing combat damage to a player. Notice that it has to be to a player. If Wind Rider Patrol is simply hitting another creature or it gets blocked, it's not hitting a player, so there's no trigger there. Same goes for cards that hit other creatures and trigger. Briar Bridge Patrol deals damage to one or more creatures. You investigate or get a clue token. You have to hit a creature in order for that trigger to even happen. There's no activation there. It simply will happen and go on the stack once the conditions are met for that ability to trigger. So how do triggered abilities use this stack? Well, triggered abilities are placed on the stack the second the condition or event that triggers them happens. So if it says at the beginning of your upkeep, this ability happens, the second you go to your upkeep, that ability is now on the stack and you have to resolve it like you would any other spell. Once a triggered ability is on the stack, this is very, very important, it is no longer tied to the source of the ability. We'll see an example here in just a second. Except in very specific case cases, countering or removing the source of the triggered ability will not stop the ability from resolving. This is very important for triggered abilities on creatures. A lot of people seem to think that if you kill a creature in response to its ability triggering, that the trigger shouldn't happen. In most cases, this is not true. The trigger will still happen. So let's look at an example here. Let's say I cast my Toppelgeist. Favorite card, by the way. Absolutely fantastic. I cast my Toppelgeist, and it successfully resolves, it enters the battlefield, and it has that little line of text there that says, when Toppelgeist enters the battlefield, you tap a target creature and opponent controls. Well, let's say it's not getting countered, this happens, the ability goes on the stack, and before I tap a creature, my opponent gets a chance to respond, they maybe have something that they want to do. Well, let's say, aha, my opponent wants to kill Toppelgeist, he doesn't want his creature to be tapped. Well, he uses Geist Blast, very fitting removal for Toppelgeist, by the way. He uses Geist Blast, targeting Toppelgeist, to deal 2 damage to it. So, 
Geist Blast goes on the stack above Topple Geist enter the battlefield trigger. Remember, I haven't tapped the creature yet. My opponent wants to respond. Well, is this going to stop me from tapping a creature or not? The answer here is no. What's going to happen is Geist Blast will resolve. It'll deal two damage to Topple Geist, and Topple Geist will in fact die. But notice that Geist Blast didn't interact with the stack at all. It didn't target Geist's ability. It simply targeted the creature itself, and that's already resolved and off the stack. Toppelgeist entered the battlefield trigger is still on the stack. It's still going to happen. So even though he killed the source of the ability, Toppelgeist will die, but its ability will still tap the creature that it targeted. When West Geist Blast somehow removed Toppelgeist's ability from the stack, it's not going to stop the creature from tapping. And there aren't very many ways to remove an enter the battlefield trigger or a triggered ability from the stack in general. They just don't print that many cards that do it. So keep in mind, just because something triggered an ability doesn't mean that killing the source of that trigger is going to stop the ability from happening. If you really wanted Toppelgeist's ability to be null and void, you would have to counter Toppelgeist, or you'd have to prevent your opponent from playing it in the first place, or you'd have to find a way to counter its enter the battlefield trigger, which is very, very tough to do in most sets. Moving on, we have cast triggers. These are a little more complicated, and uh, they require manipulation of the stack. They require you to really understand how the stack works. And I'm thinking maybe one of the videos should be on the stack. So if you think that's a good idea, if you really have trouble with how the stack works and how abilities are stacked together, let me know, and that might be a video I whip up. Because I think the stack is a really interesting, um, really non-intuitive part of the game that takes a lot of patience to kind of understand the nuances of it. But let's see how cast triggers work. So some abilities will trigger when you cast a card. The ability actually goes on the stack independently from the card you cast to trigger. And this sounds a little weird, but I'll have an example here. So if a card says when you cast blah blah blah, that actually puts a trigger on the stack that's separate from the card you actually cast. We'll see a card here, a very familiar looking card. Now, when you, when an ability triggers um, in response to you casting the card, that ability actually goes on the stack above the card you cast, which means that the ability will resolve before the card you actually cast. It gets a little tricky here, and this is how it gets complicated for newer players. So let's jump right into the example, and hopefully this will clear up what I'm trying to say. Let's say I'm casting Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. I'm trying to win the game. I got to the late game, and I'm trying to wrap it up. So I want my Ulamog to do as much damage as possible. Now, when I cast Ulamog, read that first line. It says, when you cast Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, exile two target permanents. Notice that that's a cast trigger. It does not say when Ulamog enters the battlefield, exile two target permanents. It's when you cast him, you exile two target permanents. So Ulmog will actually not resolve until his cast ability resolves. So I target two permanents. Remember, Ulmog is still on the stack, but it's a separate part of the stack now. The ability is not tied to Ulmog anymore. Let's see what the stack looks like here. I cast Ulmog from my hand. Obviously, the ability won't happen if I don't cast it, so Ulmog is on the stack first, and as soon as I cast it, that ability triggers and goes on the stack, but it's actually above Ulmog itself, so the exile trigger will resolve before Ulmog enters the battlefield. A little tricky, kind of interesting that an ability off a creature will happen before that creature even becomes a creature, but my opponent's not having it. My opponent doesn't like to play fun magic, so he casts a counter spell. He does not want my Ulamog on the battlefield. He doesn't want to deal with the 10-10. He says, nope, I'm going to counter it. So my opponent's cast Void Shatter, trying to exile Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. The stack will now look like this. Void Shatter is front and foremost on the stack. It's ready to resolve first. It's above everything else. Uh, Ulamog is still sitting there. Ulamog's ability is still sitting there. Void Shatter is targeting only Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. It did not target the ability. The ability is separate from Ulamog. So what happens here? The result is Void Shatter will resolve, and Void Shatter will successfully counter Ulamog. But notice Ulamog's trigger is still on the stack. With Ulamog removed, with Void Shatter removed, assuming nobody else is playing anything, the only thing left on the stack to resolve is the trigger. So even though the source of the trigger is gone and exiled and countered, Ulamog's trigger will still resolve. It is still on the stack. Void Shatter would have to specifically target the trigger 
in order to get rid of it, and Void Shatter simply can't do that. If you had a card that said counter target triggered ability, you would be able to target the trigger with it. But in this case, Void Shatter can only target a spell, and a cast trigger is not a spell. So Ulmog will still exile two permanents, even though he's been exiled and countered himself. Very, very interesting interactions here. Alright, and then the last kind of complication that I think was necessary for beginners to understand is that there are sometimes simultaneous triggers. An event can cause multiple triggers to all happen at the same time, and each trigger will go on the stack separately. It doesn't all get bundled up at the same time. Each individual trigger takes a separate spot on the stack. Now the question then is, what order do they go on the stack? Do I get to choose what it happens if my opponent has abilities? Think about this situation. If a creature dies, and I and my opponent both have abilities that trigger when a creature dies, who gets to use their abilities first? Well, this is how it works. If I'm the turn player, whoever the turn player is, they put their triggered abilities on the stack first. They don't resolve yet until all triggered abilities are put on the stack. So I put mine on the uh, stack first because I'm the turn player. Then my opponent gets to put theirs on the stack. And then assuming nobody else has any responses, no more instants are being cast, no other abilities are being activated, the stack will start to resolve with my opponent's abilities first, and then mine last. A little bit odd, but that's just how it works. So obviously, let's get an example here. I currently have these two cards on board. Zulport Cutthroat says when a creature dies, or when a creature I control dies, each opponent loses a life and I gain a life. Grim Hairspec says when another creature dies, I draw a card. Now, if a creature I control dies, I'm going to get both these abilities. But let's say my opponent also has something that cares about creatures dying. Shadows of the Past says whenever a creature dies, my opponent gets to scry one. Now, obviously, this is all going to have some sort of chain reaction in response to a creature dying. Let's say it's my turn and a creature has died, causing all three of these cards to trigger in response to that death. How do they go on the stack? Well, like I said, I'm the turn player, so I get to put my triggered abilities on the stack first. I have two triggered abilities here, one from Cutthroat, one from Grim Harispex. I get to choose the order I want to put them on the stack. Sometimes it won't matter, sometimes it will. Whichever one you want to resolve first, you want to put that on the stack last. Whichever one you want last, you put on first. Remember, it stack goes in reverse order. So, I'm going to put Cutthroat's ability on the stack, and then I'm going to put Harispex's ability on the stack. They do not resolve yet. Shadows of the Past still has to be placed on the stack before I get my abilities. So, all my abilities are on the stack. It's going to go to my opponent next. He's going to put his triggered abilities on the stack. So, Shadow is actually on the stack last. And then the result is the abilities will start to resolve, assuming nobody else res responds to anything. No other triggered abilities need to be put on the stack. So my opponent will scry from Shadows of the Past. I'll draw a card from Harispex. And finally, I'll drain a life with Zulport Cutthroat. This, is on this really only gets complicated when both players have triggers in response to the same kind of effects or the same kind of events. It happens a lot in Magic, so you need to know how it works, especially when both players have triggered abilities happening at the same time. The key is to remember that the turn player puts their abilities on the stack first, meaning that the turn player is actually going to get the benefits of their effects last. Finally, a couple special notes here. Just two things I thought were very, very important to point out, especially for the newest of new players. There are abilities that say May in them, and there are abilities that do not say May in them. Um, players will often abbreviate this as, oh, well, this creature has a May ability, or this creature does not have a May ability, in quotes, not like an official term or anything. If the ability says May, you have an option of whether or not you want to use it. If the ability does not say May, you must perform that action if possible. So look at Mana War. Mana War says, when Mana War enters the battlefield, return target creature to its owner's hand. This is an enter the battlefield trigger, an ETB effect, but it is not a May ability. It does not say you may return target creature to its owner's hand. You must return it. That means if Mana War is the only creature on the battlefield, you must return Mana War to the hand. If your opponent has another creature, you can't choose to leave it there. You must bounce a creature on the battlefield if possible. The second thing I want to point out is specifically dice triggers. The word die means to go from the battlefield to the graveyard. That's literally what the word die means. So if a creature that triggers when it dies, 
never goes to the graveyard or it's exiled instead or it's returned to the hand, that trigger never happens. Die triggers are very, very common and a good way to get around them is to exile them instead. So if you don't want Havoc Demon's die trigger to resolve when it goes away, you need to get it rid of it some other way than sending it to the graveyard. You can exile it, you can return it to the library, do whatever. This is a lot different than leaves the battlefield triggers, which will trigger regardless of where the creature goes. Die specifically means a triggered ability that happens when a creature goes from the battlefield to the graveyard, and that's it. Not from the hand and then discard it to the graveyard or anything like that. Battlefield to graveyard. That's what dies means. Alright, and that's all I've got for us here. Um... So I hope this has been helpful for some people, and I hope that the distinction between activated and triggered abilities is something that's even worth talking about in the first place. I feel like it is. I feel like it's come up a lot, especially, have you ever played with suppression bonds? It says um, creatures can't activate their activated abilities. What kind of abilities does that stop from using, and what kind of abilities does it let me still use? Hopefully, if you're new to the game, and you've been playing for a little while, and you've been having confusion about this, you now know the difference between the two. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments. If you felt this was helpful, or you felt it was a complete waste of time, let me know. And if I said anything that was incorrect, misleading, or just, just flat out wrong, please let me know so I can correct myself. I try to be as accurate as possible. I have a lot of experience with the game. So... I wouldn't be sharing this if I didn't feel like I had it under control. Um, additionally, if you have any certain uh, subjects that you feel like I should cover, or if you're a new player and you're struggling with something and you really want to know how a specific thing or action in the game works, let me know in the comments below and I'll see what I can do about getting a video together for you. And that's it for this. Um, I will be back with this uh, series. I like doing it just for a couple select people. I know it will help even if you know it's not drawn in a huge crowd or anything. But as always, please like, comment, subscribe. Especially comment that gets the conversation going, that gets the, uh, the kinks worked out, so to speak. But like, comment, subscribe. I will be back for more videos eventually, um, as soon as I have the time for it. This is Timothy speaking. I appreciate you guys watching, and I will see you next time.